So we, we might get cracking. Uh, my name's Tim Shaw. Um, I'm Professor of eHealth at the University of Sydney, I, I, and I chair the um, Community Practice in Education, which sponsors uh, this event. So we've run this, I think this is the third year we've run it now, and it's always been a really popular session. Um, so, uh, and it's a rapid fire session. I always say that I have a fairly low attention span, so I really like these kind of sessions. So the idea is that you, you, we move through a number of presentations quickly, which I th actually think is really important in, in the space of kind of implementation translation, because often you're hearing things that may be slightly different to what you're doing, and it's good to get a spread, rather than wanting to listen for hours to one person just talking about what you do. Um, so, just to, um, before we start this, just to mention the implementation community practice. So, many of you are already members of this. It's really taken off, actually, in the, in the last 12 months in particular. So, if you're not, I encourage you to register down the bottom. We're about 700 people um, now registered within this community. And um, these are just some of the recent events we've run. The, um, actually, the, if any of you are PhDs, the... Um, the PhD Where To Next event was very popular on the bottom left. We, we had that sold out in, in 24 hours, literally, of releasing the ticket. We had a great one on data, another really nice one on frameworks. So it's a very active community, so I encourage you to join that. And I, and I thank, in particular, the research directors and managers from each of the TCRCs that very actively contribute to this, and, and each of the translational cancer centres actually run events as we run through the year. So as I said, I encourage you to, to join that. So what we're going to do now then is, is run through the um, rapid fire uh, presentations. Uh, we should fairly easily be able to pick up and catch up on the um, time we've lost because we, we've got a three minute interchange between them and we'll cut that probably down to one without much trouble. We're not going to ask questions during the sessions. We'll come to them at the end. So please feel free to write down um, any questions you might have, and then if we have time at the end, um, we'll ask the, um, we'll, you can give those to the presenters at that point. So, without further ado, and I should say there's a, there's a, there's a, um, a prize for this uh, session as well. It's, a, it's quite a, a generous prize of about, a, I think it's $1,000 to contribute to um, some research or travel. So the competition is usually fairly fierce. So, and there is a wow factor piece, which is one of, the, um, one of the judging comments, not to put you under any pressure or anything. So you can still win it without being too wowed. But um, yeah, just, just yeah. anyway, it's a, it, we, we, we try and make this a lighthearted fun session. So we will pull people off if they go over six minutes. Okay, so the first presentation is um, Melissa Grand, and uh, Melissa's talking about a novel approach to the management of radiation oncology clinical trials, focus on quality processes and improving participation. Thank you. So the aim of this presentation is to provide an overview of the obstacles to radiation oncology clinical trials um, that we have identified as part of an audit and then highlight the processes that we developed as part of a novel approach to overcome these obstacles and also in, um, improve our clinical trial performance. So historically our departments um, experienced issues with suboptimal screening and recruitment, um, poor good clinical practice or GCP compliance and inefficiencies in the coordination of studies and we obviously wanted to try and improve these. So the first step in the process was employing a team specifically to coordinate radiation oncology clinical trials as previously there had been a radiation uh, there had been an oncology wide approach. So the new yeah, sorry the computer's in the way. So the new team commenced in December 2014 and had specific skills in nursing, radiation therapy and clinical research. The team was responsible for performing an audit on all processes, as well as investigator and patient files. Um, and we, um, we also looked at what we had previously reported through to the Cancer Institute New South Wales portal for screening and recruitment over the years. We developed an action plan with the ethics team to ensure that the studies were conducted as per GCP guidelines um, moving forward. And this also allowed us to track our progress, which proved successful with the audit. A spreadsheet was developed to re record trial progress, including screening and recruitment data. And um, the development of our processes were focused on improving our performance and conduct, and most importantly, GCP compliance. We used the data that we reported to the Cancer Institute New South Wales portal for the number of screened and recruited patients each year um, to be able to monitor our success. 
So what did we implement? So a number of processes were implemented that helped us to improve performance and these um, included and was most importantly active education of all staff involved in radiation oncology clinical trials and this included um, in training our radiation oncology trainees as well. Improved communication processes were developed to allow clinicians to effectively communicate and with the clinical trial staff. And also, um, this was really important because they were then able to record and report their screened um, patients to us and we'll be able to, we were able to um, document that. The major change in the communication change was the introduction of a generic clinical trials email account. So everyone was able to communicate directly with the clinical trials team and all of our team have access to that account. So someone's monitoring the account at all times. Proactive screening for potential participants was implemented, including attendance at multidisciplinary team meetings, um, actively screening clinic lists each week, um, and development of systems using our Mosaic, um, using Mosaic, which for those that don't know, it's a um, medical record system that we use in oncology. Um, and this was used, um, Mosaic was used to develop a clinical trial screening assessment tool for clinicians to complete. And the idea of this was that this is completed um, after every new um, patient consult in radiation oncology whether a patient is eligible for a trial or not. Monthly screening and accrual reports were developed and provided to all involved in trial screening and, recru and recruitment. And there was also a change in the ov overall work processes and we designed these to be less reliant on clinicians and more reliant on clinical trial staff. There was also improved GCP compliance and, now, and we now have 100% of our staff that have completed a GCP certificate. Study coordination improved with the development of templates to aid this and we developed all of these ourselves. And the generic clinical trials calendar was used to document when all clinical trial patient studies visits are due um, and booked in so that no appointments are missed for study visits. All paperwork is prepared and made available to the investigators at the time of the patient study visit appointment which was not happening previously and we're missing a lot of data. So what, as a result of this we now have less data queries and less requests for missing CRFs. The quality of data submission has improved through, ac through accurate collection of data at the required time points. So as a result of the implementation of this novel approach, we evaluated the Cancer Institute New South Wales portal data and there was an increase in the number of reported screened patients from 51 in 2014 to 755 in 2016. The number of studies open during this in time also increased from 20 to 36 with a full complement of staff. Participation in clinical trials as a percentage of new patients seen in radiation oncology clinics increased from 2.6% in 2014 to 12.2% in 2016. And we had lots of discussion about how we would calculate this. Um, and this was calculated from the total number of individual patients that were um, uh, participating, consenting to participate in a clinical trial, divided by the number of patients that attended as a new patient in radiation oncology clinics at that time. So this change in processes has led to a more proactive approach to clinical trials participation, in particularly more active engagement from clinicians, but the processes have been developed to be less reliant on them and more reliant on clinical trial staff. Clinicians are provided with a monthly screening and accrual report per study and per clinician, which does lead to some healthy competition. So in conclusion, the implementation of a team dedicated to radiation oncology clinical trials has been a major factor in, this, in our success. As a result of the audit, obstacles were identified and processes were developed and implemented that have allowed, um, have been shown to improve communication and performance with study compliance, as well as um, increase the number of screened and recruited patients to, for radiation oncology clinical trials. Excellent, nicely timed as the first go. So we are going to move the, uh, the flag wavers over here. Well, you can sit at the front if you like. You don't have to stand up so you can be seen. That's great. OK, so the next um, presentations um, from uh, Thomas Tran from the Cancer Therapy Centre Liverpool Hospital. And Thomas is talking about the quest towards better data collection, automation and scalability of lung cancer MDT study. Thank you. I guess I'll skip the intro. <laughs> So I, I, I guess the first thing I'd like to say is I'd, I'd like to start off by saying that my expertise is not, not the, the, the MDT content and data requirements. So I'll be talking about our review and implementation 
of the lung MDT form, um, mainly from our oncology information system team's point of view, utilizing Mosaic as our cancer EMR. So for our, our lung MDT form, it's been used at Liverpool since, since 2005, and over those years it's been growing to become a big and com comprehensive form with, over, with close to 100 data fields. The request to revise our lung MDT process was made by our, our chair, who wanted to streamline the process because it was a, it's a very resource-heavy process and requires um, the, the MDT chair and coordinator to do it very well. Um, so I, I guess an, another thing that, that um, the chair wanted to do was, was to try and make the process, the whole process, as user-friendly as, pos as possible. From my point of view, I guess what, what I wanted was to produce a process that, that would encourage that, that data to be collected by end, end users, whereby the process could easily scale to all of our, of our MDT groups and to auto automate through, through, through pro pro processes and as many processes as, as possible to to, um, to allow the staff to, to, to concentrate on the actual meeting itself in, instead of um, the, the processes of, of trying to create the agendas, the meetings, and, and, and typing up the, um, the, M, uh, the, the GP letter. Sorry, this is my first talk, so I'm quite nervous. Um, so I, I guess the main three areas that we wanted to improve on for our MDT was to, to collect our, our, our data better, to automate as many processes as, as possible, and to scale this. The review of the lung M MDT process was designed from the start with the in intention that we were going to, to develop a process that would scale across all of our MDTs. And whilst, whilst being a, a process that, that would be easy for, for the Mosaic administrators, such as, as myself, to maintain. For the lung M MDT, it started off with the, the revision of the form, ensuring that all of the, the relevant fields were, were, were present and that we were going to make the form as easy to use as, as, as possible. For the lung M... Uh, um, so what we end, end up doing was we had split up the form into two main parts. One part of, of the form hold, hold, holding the, 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 the pre-meeting uh, information and, and, and the second tab of, of the form hold, holding the, the meeting discussion and, and, and consensus. We used um, re reports to, to, to generate the, the agenda, the, the minutes um, that, that were extracted from the form. And we improved the, the MDT letter Sorry, and we um, improved the the MDT letter using a, a, a template that would pull out all of the information from Mosaic. We're currently rolling out this process to our breast MDT group, group with early indications that the whole process scales quite well. So now the only the, the, the delay that, that that we're getting in in our rollouts is is more of of agreements by the the, the the adopters and the group of what the content of the, the letter it's, it's itself is. Um, the head head neck group have have, have begun work and and our our, our gynae group have also in, indicated interest to adopt the same process. So um, not all of it, it has, has gone well. We, we did um, create a, a web-based MDT so, so submission form that, that was de developed for, for patient referrals to the MDT. This has proved to be time consuming by our, whoops. So this has proved to be time con consuming by our, our, our MDT um, co coordinator as it uh, requires that person to transcribe the inf information into the Mosaic MDT form. I guess what, what this means is, is that there is a, a lot of work from, from our point, point of view to further develop and refine the M, MDT process, but I guess um, once we, 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 we've narrowed down or, or, or improved the process for the lung MDT process, that it would scale to all of our MDTs. So for this last um, tab, um, I guess as, like, as we're, we're, we're moving forward, um, we're, we're, our end goal is to try and automate as, as much of the MD proce MDT process as, as, as possible. What we want for the web-based MDT patient submission form is to replace it with, with an automated process that would interface straight into Mosaic and, and it would fill in the form. So we know that, 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 that this is achievable because we've, we've worked on a, a project called the Prompt Care Project, which um, which, which converts the, the, the data from, from the web-based form into a, a language that Mosaic can understand and pull into Mosaic. 
So I guess if like you know we we're, we're currently investigating if 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 we can ad adapt this, this this form sorry this this pro pro process or if we'll have to create our own process, but that's something that we're looking at at, at the moment. Uh, we're also working on, on on making further refinements for our ad ad agenda and minutes reports, so, so that it will automatically generate as soon as the M MDT um, chair will, will approve that form in Mosaic. Um, and we aim to use a, f a feature in uh, Mosaic called IQ scripts, which will, uh, will which will automatically create the, the 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 letter to be sent out to the the, the GP. And that will feed into our, our outbound it interface, which currently sends to Power Pal Chart. But we're currently in investigating the, the, the feasibility of interfacing Mosaic with um, with, with a, a, a program, with be it Healthy Net or, or another program, to send it out to our GPs. So I guess in so in conclusion, uh, through our work with the Lung MDT process, we've developed a process that has um, improved our data collection, automated many of our tasks, and one that has been able to scale to our other MDTs. Thank you. Well done, look, as a first presentation, that was a baptism of fire for you. <laughs> you got a full room and six minutes with alarms going off, so well done, Thomas. And, and look, I'm, I, I really like to add as well, because it's great that you're here as, as an IT person as well. I think this, I mean, I'm a huge proponent for, for co-design, and I, I really, you know, I think it's, I can hardly think of other conferences we've had where we've had IT people presenting. We, we really need to encourage that a lot, so, so well done. <laughs> You'll calm down in a while, it's okay. <laughs> Just enjoy the endorphins. <laughs> They're free. Um, okay, so, so next we uh, move over to uh, Ben Smith. So Ben's been a, a really big supporter of the community. Um, so Ben's talking with us about um, uh, cancer research participation by culturally and linguistically diverse patients in southwestern Sydney from 20, uh, 2006 to 16, a retrospective analysis. Thanks, Ben. So hopefully I don't have to convince anyone in this room of the importance of clinical trials. Um, they really are the foundation with which we advance cancer care. Uh, without clinical trials, we wouldn't know things like that uh, the Gardasil, the HPV vaccine, could prevent up to 70% of cervical cancer cases, for instance. Um, however, despite their importance, uh, international uh, studies have found that only a very small proportion of cancer patients take part in trials. And that uh, patients from culturally and linguistically diverse or CALD backgrounds are particularly underrepresented. And what this means is that the results of trials may not be applicable to CALD patients, and that it potentially increases health disparities because CALD patients are missing out on the state-of-the-art care and increased monitoring associated with trial participation. Uh, given the lack of Australian research investigating this important issue, uh, the aims of this study were to establish both rates and correlates of trial participation amongst CALD patients. And this was done in southwestern Sydney LHD, um, which is a very ethnically diverse area of Sydney. Um, in order to do this, we conducted a multivariable logistic regression analysis of almost 20,000 uh, patients diagnosed and or treated for cancer between January 2006 and July 2016. Um, and other demographic and uh, clinical variables were included in our multivariable model. Uh, <clears throat> and we looked at interactions to see whether those variables moderated uh, participation by CALD patients. Uh, before I show you the res main results of our analysis, I'd just like to cover a few definitional issues. So in this analysis, we uh, defined research participation as participation in any research study, uh, whether it be an observational or an interventional study. Uh, and CALD status is broken down into the three groups that you can see at the bottom of this graph. Um, firstly, you had your non-CALD patients. So those are patients born in English-speaking countries, such as Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US and the UK. Uh, you then have your CALD patients who were born in a non-English speaking country, but whose preferred language was English. So they're the CALD PLE group in the middle there. 
Um, and thirdly, you have your CALD patients whose preferred language was not English or the CALD PLNE group. So what we found was that 8.4% uh, of non-CALD patients uh, took part in research, which may seem quite low, but is actually um, pretty comparable to or even a bit better than international estimates. Um, interestingly, when we looked at the CALD group whose preferred language was English, um, their rates of trial participation were no different to non-CALD patients, with 7.7% of that group taking part in trials. However, when you looked at the CALD patients whose preferred language was not English, uh, they were almost half or more than half as likely to take part in trials than non-CALD patients, and almost half as likely to take part in trials as their um, CALD counterparts whose preferred language was English. Um, we didn't find any significant interactions of CALD status with other uh, demographic and clinical variables, suggesting that these relationships hold for CALD patients from varying socioeconomic backgrounds, for example, and CALD patients uh, with varying stages of cancer. So what, this what we believe these results show is that the fact that CALD patients whose preferred language was English um, were just as likely to participate in trials as non-CALD patients, we feel that this indicates that CALD patients generally are probably just as willing to take part in trials as non-CALD patients, but the fact that the CALD patients whose preferred language is not English uh, were much less likely to take part indicates that language barriers rather than cultural barriers are the major impediment to trial participation. Uh, we did find evidence that these barriers can be overcome. Um, we, we identified a trial that was focused on the psychological well-being and quality of life of CALD cancer patients, and they managed to recruit more than 100 patients to that study using bilingual research assistance and translated study materials. Uh, we actually excluded those patients from the study because we didn't, from our analysis, because we didn't feel it was indicative of the kind of strategies used in clinical trials generally, but it does show that these barriers can be overcome um, if we try. Um, we understand that this is a difficult issue to, to overcome, but we encourage people to think twice before they tick the box uh, so stating that their study specifically excludes people whose primary language is other than English next time they're filling out a NEEF. Um, and in order to help people do that, we're currently working on developing some simplified and translated uh, trial information materials presented in multiple uh, mediums, such as audio formats, to help overcome the language and concomitant uh, literacy barriers that are commonly seen in CALD patients. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ben. Great. Um, so um, now moving on to um, Kelvin Trung, um, who's going to talk about a retrospective pharmaceutical financial benefits analysis of clinical trials participation. Welcome. Thank you. Great. OK. Fantastic. So I'm Kelvin, and today I have the pleasure of talking about a retrospective pharmaceutical financial benefits analysis of clinical trial participation. So a bit about clinical trials. Uh, clinical trials confers many quantitative benefits, um, one of which is the ability to save healthcare systems money. And it can do this via cost avoidance. Cost avoidance can be defined as the money that someone would have spent but did not because of an intervention. And in the context of a clinical trial, particularly phase three clinical trials, pharmaceutical sponsors which pay for or uh, provide the PBS listed standard of care drug um, essentially saves governments and hospitals money. And um, in the literature, uh, this has been demonstrated to save hospitals a lot of money. Um, but what hasn't been recognized under cost avoidance is the ability of patients to access medicines um, which they would not have otherwise been able to access. And examples of these include um, receiving investigation on new agents which subsequently become listed or registered for the trial indication, um, which really means that they've received efficacious therapy ahead of time. Um, it also includes being able to access TGA registered, uh, but not PBS listed drugs. And if it weren't for clinical trials, they'd either had to pay for this 
um, or go through a compassion access scheme or a special access scheme. And finally, being clinical trials, some patients are able to access standard of care agents available internationally, but not registered by the TGA. So, the aim of our project was to calculate the financial benefits and the pharmaceutical cost avoidance of clinical trial participation at a single research unit. And we did this at Concord Hospital. Um, we went back 10 years and we looked at trials which satisfied our inclusion criteria, which is trials which produced either a cost avoidance and or financial benefits. And we looked at the dispensing records and calculated the cost of these drugs and um, using the PBS as a benchmark. However, some drugs weren't available on the PBS and we used um, another reference source for that. So these were our results. In the past 10 years, um, this clinical trials unit was able to um, score $13.5 million in financial benefits. And it's in the green here, sorry for the small font. And most of this has been driven by brutinib, uh, a brutinib tyrosine kinase inhibitor, as well as obinutuzumab, venetoclax, and athletamide derivative pomalidomide. In addition to that, um, cost avoidance surmounted to $3.7 million. So again, this is money that the government would have spent had it not been for clinical trials. And what we found was the main contributors to cost avoidance in the last 10 years was mainly rituximab, uh, the anti-CD20, and also pomalidomide. So from our research, what we've really shown is that access to medicines through clinical trials confers both financial benefits and again, this is where patients are accessing drugs, which they would not have otherwise been able to access. And also cost avoidance, which is savings to the government because patients are participating in clinical trials. So in light of our research, um, in light of our research, uh, the economic value of clinical trials uh, to the community is substantial. And that a greater expansion of clinical trials through New South Wales or the country and would bring about um, greater economic benefits. Thank you. Thanks, Kelvin. Um, so now we're um, moving on to Dr. B. Brown um, from Sydney Catalyst, and B is going to be talking about embedding research and evidence in cancer healthcare, the Enrich program. Thanks, everybody. So, um, so Enrich is a flagship program of Sydney Catalyst that's being conducted um, in conjunction with Sydney Local Health District. We also have support from St Vincent's Health Network Sydney and Western New South Wales and Mid North Coast um, Local Health Districts as well. So, Enrich basically has two primary but um, interconnected um, objectives. So the first objective is to assemble a prospective clinical cohort of lung cancer patients to better define, treat and care for those patients who are being treated in New South Wales. So there are a range of predefined core research questions that are associated with data that will be collected on this cohort, such as what are the molecular disease and patient characteristics of patients with lung cancer? What's their natural history in terms of their survival, overall survival, um, and patient-reported outcomes? Um, and what are the main prognostic factors associated with these outcomes in terms of molecular um, patient and disease characteristics? Um, things to do with what are the current patterns of care for these patients in terms of modalities of treatment, supportive care services, and evidence-based protocols? And what are the barriers associated with um, you know, a, a adhering to evidence-based practice? Um, we're also looking at how these patterns of care vary according to patient and institutional factors, things like CAL populations, um, patients with low socioeconomic status, and then looking at typical health system resource use as well for these patients, and is greater resource use actually associated with better outcomes. Um, and then additionally, you know, looking at does the evidence of upta uh, uptake of evidence-based practice actually result in better patient outcomes. The second program objective is actually then looking at working with the clinicians, cancer services, and local health districts to actually generate new research ideas and new evidence where we've identified gaps in care. And this is where we've kind of got this bottom-up process of, um, of research where these study research questions will be generated by the researchers with um, data that's coming out of the cohort. 
So the program is a five-year program. We've actually just entered the second quarter of year two, amazingly. I don't know where that time has gone. Um, so we're actually at the process where we've developed our protocols. We're actually currently piloting. We've started recruiting patients. We'll be coming to the end of that pilot phase in the next month or so, and we'll be rolling out more broadly to our participating sites. So the program is structured so that we've got patients from our seven clinical sites, which are affiliated with Sydney Catalyst, all contributing patients into the cohort. We have two cohorts, a cohort of newly diagnosed patients, and then those patients who identified at first progression or recurrence. And we'll be collecting a minimum data set on all of these patients, with or without patient consent, to answer these predefined core research questions. We then have a process of patient consent, which will enable us to connect, um, collect biospecimens, so serial blood samples and um, excess diagnostic tissue for these patients for um, bench to bedside T1, T2 research projects, and um, patient reported outcome measures um, collected through questionnaires. And in relation to what Ben's just said, we've actually just gone through a process where we've had these measures translated into five different languages that we have identified as the five key languages around the districts that we're actually recruiting patients from. We've also got um, consent to um, collect data from routinely populated data sets for routine data linkage. So MBS, PBS, admitted data, patient data collection, emergency de department data collection, and um, New South Wales cancer registry data. And all of these data will then filter into um, T1, T2 substudies and T2, T3 substudies. So we have various examples of ideas of studies that have already been thrown at us, and it seems every time we talk to a crowd, people have more and more ideas. Um, how we will actually decide what we can do with finite samples is what one thing, <laughs> but that's for the steering committee to deal with. Um, so we have examples of a lot of biomarker research around thrombotic risk, circulating tumor DNA, biomarkers associated with cachexia in metastatic disease, and studies of tumor biology through rapid autopsy program. Um, that's something that's come up from St. Vincent's. Um, we have a range of molecular studies around molecular profiling and obviously genomic studies as well. Um, and then many examples of the T2, T3 evidence into practice research. So intervention studies designed to address gaps. So I think going back to what we heard earlier this morning, one of the things that jumps out straight away is how can you implement effective smoking cessation counselling? Um, you know, on the data we've got from patients currently, within the medical record review, we've albeit pilot data, very small numbers, but the 18 patients that we've got that have smoking status recorded as yes, zero record of any smoking cessation counselling for those patients may be happening, but it's not in their medical records, so how do we know what's going on with them? There are other examples of those types of studies, such as um, you know, addressing delays in timely diagnosis and referral, um, underutilization of active treatment for certain patient populations, multidisciplinary team review, and one of the things that we're really hoping to look at is using those patient reported outcomes at the time of um, clinical contact so that we can actually um, you know, refer patients onto services that they may need. So I suppose overall, the aims of Enrich is that we're trying to develop research infrastructure at three key levels, really. So new top-down and bottom-up projects. So generating new evidence from the cohort in terms of access to the data and samples that are being routinely collected from those patients. Clinical research to enable evaluation of new treatments and interventions, so people are able to access the cohort to collect new samples or data. And then implementation research to actually achieve translation of existing and emerging evidence by intervention studies within the cohorts. Um, and that is enriched. Thanks, B. So we've actually caught up with ourselves now. So I encourage you to think of questions, because we'll probably have a little bit of time at the end to, to answer some uh, questions as, as, if, if we carry on on this route. So I, I've also just been asked to encourage people to, to download and use the app to vote for the uh, best posters in the lunch or afternoon tea break. So um, maybe between talks, you can download the app, and then during lunch, make sure you go and vote. Right, so the uh, next presentations from uh, Social Professor Shalini Vinod. And many of you know Shalini. So Shalini's um, talking to us today about does timeliness of care in non-small cell lung cancer impact on survival? Okay. So delays in timely diagnosis and referral for treatment have been identified as a problem in lung cancer. And benchmarks to address this have been published in the UK Denmark and Australia. The Australian benchmarks state that the time from GP referral to first specialist scene should be two weeks and referral to initial treatment six weeks. 
However, there is conflicting data on the impact of these time intervals on survival. So the aim of this study was to measure time intervals in the management of non-small cell lung cancer patients and to identify factors associated with this and to evaluate the impact on survival. We did this through an area cancer registry study of southwestern Sydney residents who were newly diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer from 2006 to 2012. Time intervals were calculated in days and this included the time from diagnosis to initial treatment and referral to initial treatment. The treatment we defined um, included surgery, radiotherapy, systemic therapy and palliative care and the first three were identified as active treatment. So over this time period we identified 1,926 patients who met the study criteria and as you can see just over half had stage 4 non-small cell lung cancer. Just under a quarter had stage 3 and the remainder had stage 1 or 2 with a small percentage unknown. Of those 1,900 odd patients 1,729 had initial treatment recorded. Oops, sorry, it didn't quite work out, but um, the majority had palliative care, um, 35%, 29% had radiotherapy, 18% um, had some form of systemic therapy, and 18% surgery. So the median time from diagnosis to treatment for the whole population was 32 days. When we just confined it to those who had active treatment, it was 39 days. And the graph on the right breaks this down by treatment modality. So the shortest time from diagnosis to treatment was for those patients who got palliative care, being a median of 19 days. The longest was to surgery, a median of 48 days, and then radiotherapy at 35 days and systemic therapy at 37 days. We did also look at um, time from specialist referral to treatment, and this was 35 days for surgery, 21 days to radiotherapy, and 25 days for systemic therapy, but we um, didn't analyze that particular variable any further. So we conducted a multivariable analysis of both factors that impacted on intervals and on survival. So in terms of um, the factors that impacted on the treatment, the diagnosis to treatment interval, older age, a good performance status of ECOG 0 to 1, having stage 1 to 3 non-small cell lung cancer, and having systemic therapy were all significantly associated with a longer diagnostic to treatment interval. And then moving on to this slide, we looked at factors which impacted on survival, but we broke it up by stage of disease. And as you can see, for stage 1 and 2 non-small cell lung cancer, the interval was not a significant factor associated with survival, but female gender and initial treatment with surgery were positively associated with better survival. In terms of stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer, the interval was significant, as was a better performance status and initial treatment of surgery. There are a number of factors in stage 4 non-small cell lung cancer, including the period of diagnosis and the pathology. So in stage 3 and 4 non-small cell lung cancer, we did find that interval was associated with survival. However, the relationship was perhaps not as expected. So what the hazard ratio there is saying is that with an increasing time from diagnosis to treatment, your hazard of mortality fell. So your survival was better with a longer interval, which is slightly counterintuitive. We looked at other studies published since 2000, which um, have evaluated this. There were eight studies which showed no association of time intervals with survival. There were three other similar studies which included all stages of lung cancer, which like us showed that a shorter time from diagnosis to treatment was associated with greater mortality, and presumably this is a result of tumor biology, uh, faster growing cancer, causing symptoms in a patient, bringing it to medical attention, and the patient receiving treatment sooner, and I guess it may often be palliative treatment in that setting. There were two studies which did show a negative impact of increased diagnostic to treatment interval on survival, and there were both surgical studies where if the interval was greater than two months, then there was a detriment in early stage non-small cell lung cancer. So just in conclusion, 
About half our patients did not meet the UK benchmark of treatment within 31 days, but despite this, at the population level, a longer diagnosis to treatment interval was not associated with poorer survival. Thank you. Thanks, Lini. Um, next, we've got Eva Bettaglini. Um, Eva's coming from the University of New South Wales and is talking on chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy in Australian cancer survivors. Okay, so um, just as a bit of introduction, um, chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy is a major side effect of cancer treatment. Um, it takes the form of nerve damage, which commences in the extremities, so in the fingers and the toes, and can progress up the limb. Um, symptoms include things like burning, tingling, pins and needles, electric shock type sensations. And um, it, as rates of successful cancer treat as cancer treatments continue to improve and rates of um, survivorship increase, uh, we're likely to see a greater number of um, people within the Australian population who experience these symptoms, which also um, lead to functional disability and decreased quality of life. Uh, despite all of this, the impact of chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, or CRPN, is currently poorly understood. And so this study um, aims to address this by looking at the impact of CIPN on the lives of Australians who've received neurotoxic chemotherapy. Um, and we're aiming in this study to reach more than 1,000 cancer survivors. So the study takes the form of an anonymous online survey, which has, uh, includes items covering demographics, cancer diagnosis and treatment, um, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy symptoms, as well as other side effects of chemotherapy, quality of life, physical activity levels, and pain. And this survey is, taking part, is being undertaken as part of a broader research study, the InFocus um, research program, which looks at chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy from a variety of perspectives. So we're also conducting um, cross-sectional and prospective studies, which include nerve testing in order to um, assess impact, prevalence, and risk factors for CIPN as well as um, studies of potential neuroprotective agents in um, animals and humans. So the survey is basically uh, complementary to the rest of our research program. Uh, today I'll be presenting results from the first 500 respondents to the survey. Uh, the mean age of respondents is 58 years and 84% of respondents thus far are female. 74% um, of respondents report currently experiencing um, CIPN symptoms, with around another 10% reporting um, having experienced symptoms at some time in the past, in addition to that. The mean duration of um, symptoms experienced is three and a half years, ranging from less than one year through to um, 22 years. In terms of chemotherapy types reported, um, the majority of patients have received report receiving either paclitaxel, docetaxel, or, or exhalaplatin. And cancer types um, represented include breast cancer, multiple, multiple myeloma, um, colorectal cancer, and ovarian cancer. Around 25% of survey respondents report that they haven't seen any improvement in their CIPN symptoms since they finished chemotherapy, um, with a greater severity of symptoms being reported in the lower limb. So around 21% of respondents report very much, so the highest level of numbness or tingling in the feet, as opposed to 10% who report very much numbness or tingling um, in the hands. In addition to this, 22% um, of survey respondents rated CIPN as the side effect that has the greatest impact um, on their day-to-day -day lives. This was second only to fatigue in terms of um, its rating of impact level. Of those who rated CIPN as the side effect that has the greatest impact on their lives, 60% um, of these reported an impact on their walking ability, um, demonstrating that 
the functional impact of this condition. In terms of quality of life, uh, those respondents who reported currently experiencing CIPM scored lower on the SF36 quality of life measure than those who didn't report current symptoms. Uh, this difference was seen both in terms of a total quality of life score as well as quality of life in specific domains, including physical functioning, physical health, um, energy levels and pain. So in conclusion, um, chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy has a significant impact on the lives of cancer survivors who experience it. Um, it's experienced by a significant percentage of those who receive neurotoxic chemo, and the symptoms can last for years. Unfortunately, a proportion of the respondents also don't see any improvement with time. Um, it has a functional impact on people's ability to conduct their activities of daily living and also um, affects quality of life. So putting all of this together, um, this supports, you know, this condition has a lasting impact which supports its need for um, further research into assessment, prevention and treatment of this condition. Uh, so the survey is still running. Um, it runs until mid-2018. Um, I've included the survey link on the slide there and um, if you'd like more information about the survey or flyer, please feel free to approach me um, after my talk today. Thank you. Thanks, Eva. Um, our next talk is Dr. Elizabeth Fredgley from University of Newcastle. So Elizabeth's going to be talking about evidence uh, practice gaps in distress management for cancer patients, preferred implementation strategies, a national cross-sectional survey. Um, so this was a national audit um, that we received funding from HCRA and the University of Newcastle to complete. Um, and the study was really driven by this problem statement on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and it's that around 45% of cancer patients will experience distress sometime over their cancer journey. And for many people, this will also extend far into survivorship as well. We also know that if distress is left untreated, it's associated with a whole host of deleterious outcomes. So things such as increased uh, rates of depression and anxiety, increased number and length of hospital stays, but also decreased survival rates, quality of life, and treatment compliance. Um, in addition to this, we also know that identifying distress and also the severity of distress is really challenging for time-poor um, healthcare professionals. So there was a large German study that suggested that around 1 in 10 distressed um, cancer survivors were correctly identified and that their healthcare professionals also weren't able to correctly determine how severe um, these symptoms may have been. Here in New South Wales, um, we had a smaller study that suggested um, even less than 1 in 10 um, cancer patients that were currently undergoing radiotherapy were correctly identified. There are quite a few um, guidelines available nationally as well as internationally around distress screening um, and management. Um, within the US, they did an audit of the NCCN member institutions, and these are really pioneers in the distress screening field. Um, and so you'd assume that among their flagship centers that they really would be on board with distress screening. Unfortunately, this audit in 2012 suggested that only around 50% were actually screening all cancer outpatients but 30% were not screaming in any form. So it was really um, this problem statement that drove our study aims, and that was firstly to identify the proportion of Australian cancer services that were following guidelines, along with the potential areas of improvement across um, components of guidelines. And we also wanted to look at what some of the barriers were to, impl to implementing or encouraging, and what preferred strategies might be. Um, we ran a, a national cross-sectional survey in 217 cancer services, and in order to participate, individuals had to be involved in daily patient care, and we adapted the survey content from the U.S. audit I just referenced. So just pulling out a few components um, across um, evidence-based guidelines, the first box on your left-hand side um, is to do with screening, and there's quite a few different components in this, but we've just picked out, the, I guess, the key ones. So, um, within the 122 cancer services that have participated thus far, um, only around 50% screen all cancer patients, and it's quite comparable to the U.S. data. 
Only 43% will screen within one month. Um, but when they do screen, 93% uh, of cancer services use a brief and validated uh, tool with a clinically valid uh, cut point. Following screening, there's a second step of assessment where you confirm the sources but also the severity of the distress. Um, and within our responding services, only 29% uh, use this two-step process. Following the screening and the assessment, um, it's, it's, a, it's use of a referral protocol that should be consistent with stepped care and as well as tiered care principles. And only approximately 28% um, of our services had a documented and consistent referral protocol. Following referral, uh, there's a follow-up period where you reassess uh, for unremitting or escalating distress, and only approximately 51% of the services uh, rescreen their patients at any time. So looking at our second study aim, which was the barriers and strategies on the left-hand side of the screen, the top three barriers to um, implementing or enhancing distress screening practices, the first one was the resources needed to actually action the referral, so the downstream capacity of a health service. And 38% of the services said that this would prevent implementation in any form. The next most common barrier was time with patients, and this was around 66%. And 28% of services said, again, this would prevent implementation in any form. 66% also said that staff training to complete the screening was needed and would be some sort of barrier, with 20% saying that this would prevent implementation in any form. When we asked services what would be their preferred implementation strategies to either improve or implement, um, the top two had to do with about education and knowledge. So around 70% wanted to attend a workshop and receive ongoing training. 57% said that they would like educational materials within their service. Um, and this was interesting to us because only approximately 45% of the individuals who participated in our surveys said that they had read a guideline. Um, and this is despite 80% of them either doing the screening or actioning the referrals from the screening. 40% said that they would like computerized support. Another challenge that came up that wasn't specifically asked, but we asked as part of our description of the screening process, was that only 22% of services had actually evaluated the process since they had implemented. So our conclusions from this data is that firstly, we need to support health professionals um, to complete the distress screening and that training is needed for most. In order to encourage ongoing practice and, re and to reinforce the benefits of distress screening, but also streamline this process, evaluation is also needed for most. And to realize the full benefits, referral protocols are essential and also needed for most. We also need to consider the health service capacity, such as time with patients and perhaps pre-screening process, but also resourcing in what the downstream support services might need and whether or not screening does in fact uh, result in more referrals. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, next speaker is Ms. Catherine Adams from Hunter, New England, again, um, local health district. So this is Catherine's going to talk about improving regional patients in Hunter, New England, LHD, access to the optimal care pathways for ovarian cancer. There we go. I think that title takes up the first three of my six minutes. Um, I guess this is a little different presentation in that we're actually looking at clinically how we can implement some of the uh, recommendations that the evidence has come up with. And so I'm sure you've all seen the various optimal care pathways that have been developed for various cancers. We were looking specifically at the optimal care pathway for ovarian cancer. I sit within Hunter New England Centre for Gynecological Cancer and I would like to acknowledge um, my co-team members, Alyssa White and Anne Mellon, who are here, and Rose Wadwell, who may be in the room, who's been incredibly generous in allowing us to build very strong relationships with the Aboriginal community and speaking to the Aboriginal elders in relation to this project. So in Hunter New England, we're the only health district that has metropolitan, regional, rural and remote areas. And so we're used to having to actually go and visit people if we want to bring about any change. And I would recommend that all of you do that. And my wow factor in this talk is if you get out there, you get to see the sunset across the Breeza Plain, which is a truly beautiful experience. Um, we visited Moree, we visited Tamworth twice, and we went to Taree. One of the big questions that came up for us is, you know, it's all well and good to have optimal care pathways. We need to have excellence in our care, but are we actually ready to implement them? And do we have successful ways of working with all of the people that need to be involved for this to happen? So 
We had three major assumptions. One is that we know that women are not very good at recognising the significance of the symptoms of ovarian cancer. And to be honest, the symptoms of ovarian cancer are the symptoms of being a woman most often. So we knew that we needed to do some work with women around education and just increasing awareness about the significance of protracted new symptoms. We knew that the GPs needed to be involved in this process and that a really crucial part of optimal care is identifying the cancer early and referring them on, and we're particularly poor at doing this at a variant cancer. The symptoms are often quite pro progressed before we see women. Um, and we, talking to our colleagues, um, the medonks and the, the um, gyneonks, felt that there wasn't really a necessity to educate the GPs around the symptoms of ovarian cancer, but it was more important to engage them in the process of actually actioning when women came in and complained about symptoms. And so in the Tamworth area, we did a mail out to 25,000 households of the Cancer Australia little DL pamphlet, Nobody Knows Your Body Like You Do which lists the primary symptoms of ovarian cancer and encourages women who've been experiencing persistent symptoms to go to their GP. So our process with the GPs was to engage with them and say, look, if women come in with one of these bits of paper, can you make sure you do something about it? As part of that process, we surveyed the GPs and practice nurses that came into the training to have a look at what they were doing now and how that melded with the pathway. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I think one of the most exciting things we did was actually engage with our Aboriginal communities, both in Tamworth and in Taree. We spent a fantastic afternoon with some elders in Tamworth, what was completely enlightening. Um, we went to their country and we let them tell us their stories. And one of the things that I think was really quite an enlightening for all of us was just the fact that we really need to respect women's business and men's business, and we're terrible at it. You know, men have female nurses taking them to the shower in hospitals. And one of the women said, have a look at your incidence of code black in your hospital and see how often it is because a woman is trying to help a man with men's business. Really simple things like that. One of the eldest, we were talking about the importance of pap smears and she said, I had one of those 40 years ago, but a fella did it, so I never went back. We're missing women for really simple reasons. So part of what we're looking at doing is training the Aboriginal health workers so they're able to perform the pap smears themselves so they can go to their own women to have these tests done. Speaking to another woman, you know, she said, but if I get cancer, I'll just go home and die. And that is still the perception. And being able to say to her, you know, across the board, we can cure around 65% of all cancers if we catch it early, but we have to be able to treat it. And you could see the understanding in her eyes and her intention to go back and tell her young people this, that they need to be aware that this isn't just a white fella disease, it affects everybody, but we can cure it. So I can't emphasise enough the importance of addressing local variation by going to the locality and actually speaking to the people that live there. The other interesting thing that came out of that, we're well aware of the difficulty in asking Aboriginal people to come into white fella institutions like our hospitals but they also struggle with their own institutions. They also struggle with going into the Aboriginal Medical Service with women's business issues because that's really private. And if I go into the Aboriginal Medical Service, everyone's gonna know that that's what's happening. So I think going and speaking to the, the Aboriginal women has been really enlightening, but also looking at what the GPs do. So the first thing you should do according to the optimal care pathway is a pelvic examination of a woman you suspect has ovarian cancer. And you can see out of the 30 respondents there, two of them think that that's necessary. As the experts, we use the risk of malignancy index to look at the risk of ovarian cancer. None of the GPs do. We really need, we can tick off on our project all of these achievements, but we actually need to sit down and look at how we can truly implement change in this system, how we can work with the PHNs and the GPs to improve their experience and their confidence, but also how we can sit with local people and address the true issues that come up for them in receiving optimal cancer care. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. That's great. We're, we're doing some work with Indigenous um, data usage at the moment, and it's incredible how we've got that wrong in so many different ways as well, until you actually speak to people that know. Okay, so our final presentation for today is um, going to be from Marina Van Leeuwen. Um, uh, and Marina's looking at reoperation of breast cancer, sorry, reoperation after breast conserving surgery for cancer 2002 to 2013. There we go. Thank you. 
Thank you for your patience. I think the last talk before lunch is probably the toughest ask because everyone's hungry. So yes, looking at reoperation after breast conserving surgery. So where it's um, clinically appropriate, current guidelines suggest that uh, women with early stage breast cancer should be offered the choice of breast conserving surgery. So what is it? It's sometimes called lumpectomy or partial mastectomy and it involves removal of the tumour or the lump plus a small margin of surrounding normal healthy tissue. However, the best estimates from population-based studies suggest that up to 30% of women require reoperation, and that's usually due to compromised surgical margins. So we set out in a population-based cohort of women with breast cancer undergoing breast-conserving surgery to answer three questions. Firstly, to determine the probability of reoperation within 90 days. Second, to see is there any variation in the reoperation rates between hospitals? And what are the health system level factors associated with reoperation? We had a linked data set involving the admitted patient data collection and the deaths registry. We use this to define a cohort of adult women with breast cancer undergoing initial breast conserving surgery. We had just over 34,400 women. We then looked to see who had another um, operation, so either a re-excision or a mastectomy within 90 days of their initial surgery. To do this, we built um, cross-classified multi-level models. So essentially, women were clustered according to the hospital in which they attended, the idea being that women attending the same hospital would receive similar care. We also clustered women according to their statistical local area of residence. We then, uh, the multi-level nature of the model allowed us to then look at hospital-level factors, including the type, the location, and the volume. And importantly, also allowed us to look at whether hospital level factors and uh, contributed to variation in, in um, reoperation rates while accounting for patient level factors and area level socioeconomic status. We had uh, two sorts of models, one with a binomial outcome, so look at any, oper any operation versus none, or um, a multinomial model looking at re-excision or mastectomy versus none. So of our roughly 34,000 women, we had to about 10,000 or almost 30% who required another operation within 30 days, within, sorry, 90 days of their original surgery. Now, almost half of these reoperations were um, mastectomies. You'll see in these caterpillar plots that there was significant variation between hospital and now. Each of these bars represent one hospital and the horizontal line along the middle is the average. And so you'll see a number of hospitals below average in green and a number above average in red. These forest plots show fully adjusted odds ratios of any reoperation or of re-excision or mastectomy specifically. And a few things that I'd like to point out was that the um, probability of re-excision has increased over time, whereas that for mastectomy decreased. Now this is a subtlety that would have been completely missed had we studied all re-operations combined. And this is um, pretty much been the way of all the international literature. So we had an exciting point of difference here. We also observed that the odds of mastectomy was uh, lower for women attending higher volume hospitals. So hospitals that performed more of this type of surgery on average. We also observed higher probability of reoperation and particularly mastectomy for women residing in non-metropolitan areas and attending non-metropolitan hospitals. And uh, when I looked at uh, interaction over time, I noticed that the discrepancy between low and high volume hospitals and um, between non-metropolitan and metropolitan areas has actually reduced over time. So to conclude, almost 30% of women who underwent breast conserving surgery um, in New South Wales during our study period actually went, underwent re-operation within 90 days and almost half of these re-operations were mastectomies. Now in my mind, this represents a, um, quite a dramatic change in the clinical course for that woman who started off having breast conserving surgery and ended, ended up with mastectomy. Now there are a variety of reasons why this has occurred and which I can't go into in six minutes. Um, we observed significant variation between hospitals, non-metropolitan location and attendance at a low volume hospital were associated with a higher probability of reoperation and particularly mastectomy. However, these um, disparities appear to have reduced over time. Thank you.